Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. If you enjoy what we do here on the show and you think it's worth your hard-earned money, you can support the show via Patreon. Just a $1 donation gets you access to bonus episodes, our Discord, and regular episodes before everybody else. If you donate at an elevated level, you get even more bonus content. A digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, and a sticker from our Teespring store. Our show will always be ad-free and is totally supporter-driven. We use that money to pay our bills, buy research materials that make this show possible, and support charities like the Kurdish Red Crescent, the Flint Water Fund, and the Halo Trust. Consider joining the Legion of the Old Crow today. And now back to the show. Hello, and welcome back to Lines of by Donkeys podcast. I don't know why I said welcome back. This isn't a series. Uh, I'm Joe, and with me is Nate. Hello. Hey, Nate. It's a lovely day in London. I, I thought the sun was going to be out, but actually it's gone behind the clouds again, which is uh, to be expected. It's January here, but also it could be April or July or August. It would still be cloudy and kind of cold here. So lovely day to learn about history and its various disasters. Speaking to you. Yeah, I I think my weather is slightly better, um, though we have entered the smog bowl season uh, in Yerevan, unfortunately. Uh, so it's not like super cold, but the smog just kind of settles into the valley that the city's based in. So like, even if you don't smoke, it kind of feels like you smoked a half pack of cigarettes if you go for a jog. Kind of sucks. Yeah, I can I can imagine. I mean, I recall this in, in Kabul same way like oh all the all the exhaust all the wood fires it's winter you know cold weather whatever the pressure system basically creates like this uh like a pancake of smog over the city so if that's yeah. anything comparable i i know i know what you're going through and yeah that sounds like shit <laughs> i think i said before on the show like is it smog is it fog the answer is yes Pretty much. Well, um, I mean, that's that's yeah. why so many Armenians moved to Los Angeles because they figured it was their, <laughs> you know, it was, it was yeah. physical geography that best resembled the kind of place they knew best. It's like if you take a fish out of water, it still has gills. Like you, you, you have to drop uh, Armenians in L.A. so they can they only can breathe the certain like baseline level of pollution. <laughs> well, you know, um, it's a country that it's a, it's an area that produces lots of wine grapes. You could make brandy. The smog will kill you. It's like this is basically <laughs> Little Armenia. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, speaking of things that will kill you, uh, a while back, Nate, we did an episode. It was 169. Uh, for those not uh, keeping track home, we talked about the Comet uh, Nazi rocket fighter, mm -hmm. um, or it was better known as the Nazi rocket death trap that would melt its pilots into a kind of chunky soup due to being powered by toxic chemicals and held together with most, mostly spit and hope. Um, Do any of these exist? In real life? Oh, yeah. Because I was at the yeah. National Air and Space Museum, and I saw some weird Nazi planes, like mini planes, and I wondered to myself, like, are these the ones on those episodes Joe was talking about? I'm, I'm a moron. I don't remember any of, like, the nomenclature, like the, you know, alphanumeric designators for the plane model and whatnot, but I saw some things that basically looked like bat wings, except they had Nazi shit all over them. And all I could think of was, like, I bet you Joe's done an episode about how this plane will absolutely, like, put you in a blender if you fly it. Yeah, there's some like the the Wonder of Often that they were cranking out. Most of them only existed on paper. Ah, uh, uh, but but they did get a lot more than you'd think of like jet and rocket design planes, mm -hmm. literally in the air, and they killed so many of their own pilots. <laughs> um, like the comet is probably one of my favorite episodes of all time because like everybody involved in flying this thing, like all the test pilots. Uh, the engineers like he was like this thing's a fucking death trap go nuts um, and like with their best test pilot crashed and all of the fluid leaked into the cockpit and he was literally turned into soup uh, oh, I mean <laughs> fuck you but also oh. and uh, this one also existed um, because everybody loves a good story about a Nazi death trap flinging some dickhead into the ground and killing them in the worst way possible uh, and the Nazis did this a lot they're actually very good uh, say what you will about the Nazis. They were really good at killing themselves. Um, and they did this a second time. And this time it was purpose built to be flown by the Hitler youth, which, ah. yeah, uh, you know, teens, preteens, <laughs> you name it. Yeah. I mean, if you ever want to see some disturbingly homoerotic artwork featuring minors, uh, definitely go. Uh, no, don't do it. Go, go to that discord. Don't go to that website. Go to the historical <laughs> archives featuring posters to recruit for the Hitler Youth. They will typically feature 
a very, very, we'll call it stylized artwork of, of, you know, shirtless boys swinging pickaxes and something to the effect of like all 10 year olds must join the, the Hitler youth or something to that effect. Uh, it's very sus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Nazis, the er- Ernst Röhm aside, like there was definitely that undercurrent there of, of sort of like all femininity is, uh, is somehow weakening and therefore we have to be masculine and pure. And that means uh, being basically like naked mud wrestling each other. Uh, all the murderous <laughs> ideology aside, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to chalk it up to kind of like a pop psychology explanation. Um, but that definitely was a, a present thing, you know, with, with just them in general. And there was, well, there, look at Mishima. It's like the same thing. Yeah. And there was this, there actually was like this kind of factionalism between like the, the sort of the gay pagans and the straight pagans amongst the Nazis. Like they were all into this sort of like Nordic rune, ancient religion shit. But some of them were like, and we achieve this by fucking boys. And others are like, no, we we don't want to do that. So, uh, if you ever Google Night of the Long Knives, if you want to learn more about the sort of internecine oh, gay yeah. versus straight fights in the Nazis. Um, but yeah, the Hitler Youth, man, gr- pretty gross organization across the board. Like, and specifically was like the way. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. Like there were some people whose kids didn't, whose boys didn't go into the Hitler youth, but like towards the end, it was mandatory. And towards the end, like it was just, you were, you were basically reserve army labor at whatever yeah, like age you were. That's one of the things that kind of baffles me that there were so many Hitler youth, uh, like recruitment posters, like, because I think it was from like 1940 on, or maybe even earlier that, uh, membership was mandatory. Same with, uh, I think it was, uh, I forget the there's a woman's version yeah. for girls as well. I forget what it's called, but like at the it, it's like it, having recruitment posters up for the army if you have conscription. Like it, it doesn't matter if I want to join or not. Like I'm gonna be there. Like come on. Uh, I mean that's why the Pope was in the Hitler Youth. Yeah, I, I think the League of German Girls. I looked it up. I'm not gonna pretend that yeah. I was uh, yeah. that I was uh, had that in the back of my mind. But yeah, Bund Deutscher Mädel. Um, was the equivalent for girls. And so, yeah, like basically there was, there was the child indoctrination thing, but also like, um, if you've ever heard of stories of people, uh, I, I know that this t- turned out to not be true. Um, but the, the German author, Gunter Grass, uh, that was sort of his like mythology was that he was one of the, um, kids conscripted into active service in the Wehrmacht from the Hitler youth. So before Gunter Grass died, I think it was revealed that actually he volunteered to join the Wehrmacht, and I think he was actually in the SS. Um, and that oh boy. and that doesn't that doesn't obviate the work that he did after the war. He was he was a uh, an East Prussian. Um, he joined. I mean, he didn't join as I understand it, until he was like probably about sixteen or seventeen at the very end of the war, like the last months of the war. But there was this kind of concept in German. Um, I don't know, like sort of when they talk about like gender, like, you know, we talk about the silent generation and the baby boomers and uh, there was a term that they had. I can't remember what it's called and I'm not going to guess because I'm going to sound stupid, but it's sort of like a term for the generation of kids who were at the very, very like I, th- I, I want to say it was like flock helper, uh, like people who were helping load the flat guns. They were uh, like kids at the end of the war, teenagers at the end of the war, and they absolutely were veterans and drafted like forcibly conscripted. But it's, you know, it's obviously a little bit different than being um, fucking, you know, like 25 when you fight in the Wehrmacht. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, not to mention the Hitler youth fighting formations were all folded into the SS. So, like, it's not like these kids. I mean, some of them, I'm sure, did. It's not like, I mean, they're children, but like you kind of guilty by association by being in the SS at that point. Yeah, but, absolutely. You know, whatever. But also one thing I say, too, before we move on is just that, like, you know, we look at rightfully with disgust at the idea of the Germans you know, creating a whole formation full of 16 year olds, but you can join the British army as a 16 year old and you are in a regular formation. Like that is absolutely wild yes. to me. <laughs> and I mean, there's a lot of groups here in the UK with stuff like, um, like sort of decruitment, anti-military recruitment things. Um, they have pointed out that like a lot of research has shown that by every appreciable life metric, kids who enlist at 16 wind up worse off in life than their peers who don't, even if they come from like the most deprived postcodes in the United Kingdom. It doesn't matter. Enlisting at 16 is like undeniably worse for you, but it's absolutely still a thing. Hey, you should do something healthier like crystal meth. <laughs> they don't have that here, Joe. They just have three liter bottles of white lightning of cider. That's true. I did see those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some guy in line in front of me at a Tesco with like 
these massive like I didn't know what they were because it doesn't look like it's cider. No, it looks like, like fucking like cheap soda. But yeah, it's like it's like four percent or six percent alcoholic cider, and they sell it for like two pounds fifty pence for a three liter. And it's called something ridiculous too. Like yeah, it used to be called White the- Lightning, but they have like Frosty Jacks is another one. They they the Frosty Jack sounds like if you beat off in fucking winter formation, but like <laughs> if a Frosty Jack is when you jerk off in the Dairy Queen freezer. Everybody knows that. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, yeah, but 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 a hundred percent. You can you can enlist at sixteen in the British military, and it's it's gross. So anyway, with that in mind, let's talk about uh, child planes. So. Nate, before we go on, I want you uh, to look up this this very lazy death trap, the HE-162 of Volksjäger, which is sometimes known as the Salamander, because I want you to know what this thing looks like. So you said HE-1602 me, Volks, I know how to spell this, but Volks- 162 Volksjäger. Gotcha. Okay. 162 Volksjäger. Yep. It's a suggestion. Oh, uh, th- so hmm. to me, it looks like a jet that you would draw when you're like 10 years old because you suck at drawing and have never actually seen a jet before. Yes. If if you as a small child imagine that the way to make a plane fast and good and cool was to put a huge engine in the center of it, like yeah. like the world's biggest, like it looks like a like. A novelty oversized remora. It looks like when the, <laughs> the big plane flies the space shuttle like into low Earth orbit. <laughs> yes. But it's on a jet, like on a plane the size of what looks like a P fifty P fifty one. So And you can imagine all of the problems that comes with that jet placement, and we will talk about that, I promise. Okay, yeah, I just see I just see a <laughs> caption or a headline in the image I looked up on Google, and it says, Volksjäger, the story of the Heinkel HE-162, the Nazi wooden jet fighter. And I'm already, I'm on board, big wooden jet fighter with a huge engine in the center of it. <laughs> what if now, the spruce goose killed you even faster? <laughs> Now, like Franz, what if we slapped a stupid jet engine on top of this plane we had lying around? No, don't bother to make it aerodynamic. It's fine. Fuck those kids. Um, you know, this is really funny, man. As an aside, and I promise I'll stop doing this, this now makes what seemed like one of the more absurd plot points in uh, Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow actually make more sense, in which they can't figure out the perfect mechanism to control the, uh, the, like the, the Schwarzgerät, like the black device, the, the best existing version of the, the V2 buzz bomb. And so finally, like the horrible Nazi guy, like basically forces his like 16 year old male sex slave to pilot the fucking bomb himself. And so like that's what they discover at the end is that the Schwarzgerät, it's not that they've built the best version of the control system. It's just that they basically made like a teen boy be a kamikaze pilot of it. Well, they did do that. Um, there was a German, like, purpose-made kamikaze thing, kind of like the Japanese Oka. But the the rumor is it was never used. Um, but then there is some evidence to suggest they did use it once. I mean, Gravity's and, Rainbow is an insane book. Gravity's Rainbow yeah. posits the existence that German naval fleets didn't have toilets on their ships, but rather it just had one ship that was nothing but toilets. So, like... I, I understand that a lot of it is fictionalized to an extreme degree, but like... You're going to give Lockheed Martin ideas. <laughs> but you know what I mean, though, is that that seemed kind of out of left field. But then when you describe this to me, I'm like, oh, no, I mean, Thomas Pynchon was a aviation engineer. He knows he, he knew a lot about this stuff. His job was deconstructing things from German documents like from the war. So maybe maybe he wasn't too far off. They they, they wanted child kamikazes. Yeah, I mean, the, that is one of the few projects that even the Nazis were working on. They're like, guys, what the fuck are we doing? Um, yeah, it takes a lot to get that reaction <laughs> from them, doesn't it? And, and also, like, very, very different. Um, like, there wasn't this suicidal sacrifice culture driven into German soldiers so much. So, like, they, the people that could still fly jets were like, why don't you just give me a regular jet? Yeah, I'm not going to say that there wasn't a cult of heroic death in German Nazi oh, fascism. Sure there there was. absolutely was. But I think there is a cultural difference, as I understand it, as regards sort of a suicide attack. And I, I mean, I, without trying to be broad strokes or like Orientalist about it, I think that this was something that was more common as i understand it in in history uh with the japanese military they oh, did absolutely yeah. recruit young kids to fly and basically just like they they trained them to fly aircraft but to take off and crash but not to land 
uh, yeah, and they to would be fair, been, by then young boys are pretty much all they had left. Yeah, and they were in the, in, <laughs> in their like mid teens, like we're talking fifteen, sixteen, yeah. seventeen years old. But like the Germans, okay, they didn't have kamikaze like deliberate suicide attack, you know, uh, pl- airplane pilots, but they absolutely, you know, were manning defensive positions, you know, on the on the border with with Poland with fourteen, fifteen year old kids who were getting smoked by Soviet artillery. So like. They knew oh, those yeah. kids were going to die. So in the end of the at the end of the day, it's the same thing. Yeah, the, the famed German uh, military motto: "Fuck them kids." <laughs> uh, now, the roots of the Volksjäger, as I'm sure you would guess, has its roots in the Nazis getting their teeth kicked in as World War II circled back around to what academics call the finding out part of history. Mm-hmm. In 1943 and into 1944, the tides had turned against the Nazi empire in a way that they would never recover. Due to constant, intense, and systemic losses on a three-front war, it was made sure they would never be able to replace the losses of bin machinery. This is coupled with the Allied bombing campaign that, while a horrific war crime, did render Germany a little more than a series of small rocks, corpses, and fire. Yes. Um, the German war machine would never be able to churn out anything of quality like they could before. And rather than seeing the writing on the wall, they had to figure out how to prolong this war as long as possible by slapping shit together in hopes that it would counter the total air superiority of the allies. I mean, this, they also did this on the ground as well, but instead of churning out like shitty tanks, they churned out badly made over overly complicated tanks that people still like to jerk off to uh that were giant pieces of shit uh but you know it kind of makes sense when you realize like oh they're putting jets together with wood now like the japanese had to do that as well um minus the jet part for them but like yeah like in the in the air it seems like their priorities were in order but on the ground um but the goddamn sun was blotted out by Allied bombers, and the Germans' only real line of defense was static AA defenses and fighter aircraft. Yeah, um, and that didn't necessarily work that well. I mean, obviously they could inflict no. they could inflict <laughs> losses on the Allies, but you know, like, and they did quite, quite, quite a great amount. But the Allies had at this point air bases. Uh, if we're talking into 1943, air bases in Britain that like Britain was still being attacked, but they could transport stuff over move it over and attack germany they also by by 1943 had forced the germans out of north africa uh depending on when we're talking in 1943 you can look at like the progress made in italy but like sicily i believe by that point belonged to them so like while they hadn't you know gotten into france yet like the allies were able to move shit and both also make stuff in america and we talk about the americans move and then base it in places where it would be safer from attack and then you start and you start to look at like what they could do with one mission. I used to live in a small town in Germany when I was a little kid and the nearest city was a town called Pforzheim and it was completely leveled on one night in like February 1945. Now Pforzheim's a big enough city that I would say it's probably like in the 50 to 100,000 range. I can't really remember, but it was a decently sized city. And yeah, so imagine a city. Now it wasn't that big in 1945, but it was still a significant city. There was a, there was munitions and military stuff there. Complete one one sortie, basically, if you want to call it that. One mission of a of like a night raid, and they leveled every structure in the town. Yeah, yeah. Like this, each one of the bombers could carry literally tons of explosives. It's fucking insane, you know. Uh, and like the the fighter wing of the Luftwaffe was still, you know causing quite a bit of losses being a bomber crewman over europe was fucking damn near suicidal mm-hmm. depending on what year it was mm-hmm. uh so they came up with operation argument uh which i have to say is a very weird name for a military operation it sounds like it should be followed by something like operation mom is going to start dating again or operation dad is just tired uh, <laughs> Nothing to do with my home life at all. Operation, uh, <laughs> uh, I like the idea of Operation Argument, though. Like, Operation, uh, we're going to defeat your defeat you in the marketplace of ideas. And that's just a code word for fully fucking obliterating everything built by a human in your country. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's the, uh, the bomber equivalent of arguing with college students uh, for the Daily Caller. Uh, now... From the 20th to the 25th of February, 1944, Operation Argument, which is also sometimes known as the Big Week because the last name wasn't lame enough, was an Allied bombing campaign that directly targeted the Luftwaffe's fighter wing in preparation for an Allied invasion of continental Europe and to secure complete and total air superiority. 
the operation was very effective, and the Luftwaffe, which is already in bad shape, would never come close to recovering ever again. In response to constant, unrelenting bombing, the Luftwaffe began to evolve as well, though it went about as well as you could imagine. Their main goal was pretty simple. How can we attack Allied bombers and stop our cities from being transformed to a series of rather bright flashing lights and screaming, di- uh, screaming noises of dead Nazis? For starters, there was the Allied fighter sweeps that the fighter escorts would, uh, they would have. Mm-hmm. They'd have to get around those in order to get to the actual bombers uh, while the bombers are tap dancing their way across Germany. Oftentimes, this is done by some fighter pilots who would swoop in and try to get the escorting p- fighters to peel off and chase them, which would then open the rest of the bombers up for uh, for the rest of the uh, Luftwaffe jet f- or Luftwaffe fighters. However, the Germans still had to contend with gun crews aboard the bombers themselves, which frequently shot down attackers or, at the very least, kept them at bay long enough for the fighter escorts to come back around and bail them out. They decided the best way to get around this is a slap on some heavier, longer range guns that would be able to inflict damage on a bomber before the bomber's gun crews could shoot at them. So they went full Acme. Okay. First, there was the Sturmbach, which was the most normal thing they have, they would attempt, and that isn't saying much. So you take your standard Focke Wolf 109, sorry, 190, with a cannon strapped uh, onto it that was so large that the airframe could hardly even carry the goddamn thing. In order to make this possible, the Luftwaffe had to strip away pretty much everything else other than like the engine uh, other, because it was so heavy that the, it could stall the plane out if they didn't strip it bare. Kind of like, you know, the, the Doolittle raids so they could carry more bombs. But this was stripping all of the armor off of this thing so they could uh, uh, build a gun around it like a very shitty A-10. Uh, gotcha. But, okay. It's so heavy that it makes the, the, the plane itself virtually uncontrollable. Uh, someone likened it to driving a car on only rims. Um, so it's so slow and unmaneuverable. And it, it actually had to be escorted by other fighters because there are such sitting ducks to escort allied fighter aircraft. This tactic was, of course, called the Sturm Group because the Nazis are terribly unimaginative. I do have to admit, though, when this tactic worked, it worked. This is, this is the most working any of these things are going to do. Hundreds of bombers were shot down this way. However, the Sturmbachs were eaten alive in much greater numbers. It didn't take long for fighter escorts to know exactly what the fuck this thing was, because you can tell from a mile away, like, holy shit, that thing's got a cannon attached to it. Uh, and once the, uh, they, they sighted it, everybody gunned for it, and they were doomed. They couldn't outrun anybody. They, could, they had like no interceptor weapons to defend themselves. You're not going to shoot down a, f- a fighter aircraft with a giant cannon, uh, and there's no armor on it, so literally one burst from any caliber weapons bringing it down. That sounds... I mean, it, once again, it sounds cool on paper, and because like on paper it's being drawn by a grade school boy, and then when you actually put it into practice, you're like, this is... Uh, it's like, I don't think anyone actually wants to build Metal Gear, the nuclear armed walking battle tank for a variety of reasons. I disagree, but go on. Well, it just seems like this is, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, like this sounds like it would sound badass on paper, but then it seems like everything that you're, you've highlighted so far is just a massive, massive, uh, structural problem to the whole device that like makes it very, very difficult to operate in a way that doesn't just like. Well, you get to fly one mission, and then you never land because you get shot down. Yep. <laughs> hey, you're really, you're really uh, uh, hurting my lobbying for the U.S. government to finally build Gundam. So thanks. Fuck. Yeah, I mean, it would be cool as hell, but like, you know, I, I think, I think we're probably gonna see stupid robot legs to like you carry a heavier rucksack sooner than any of that. Like, I don't think they're gonna build mechs yet. Like that, that may be in the future. But the closest we'll get to it is they'll definitely be like, oh, now we can we can make every soldier carry an entire water buffalo in their ruck because <laughs> they've all got fucking robot assist legs, which are going to like totally break down in the field and then you won't be able to fucking keep walking. You'll just get fucking crushed by yeah, exactly. like your you're, you're, Exactly. The hydraulics fail because like they're made by DynCorp or something like that. And then you, you just immediately get, get smushed like you were hit with Jupiter gravity as a joke. <laughs> uh, the only thing I keep thinking of, of of like the concept of walkers or mechs or anything is how like because I was a tank crewman and, and the, some of the worst things that you'd ever like oh track broke right but now you're piloting a fucking Evangelion and like oh the 
the Ava rolled its ankle. We have to fucking switch out its foot or something. It's like, this is fucking miserable. Yeah, this I, is no fun at all. I'm fighting this war in the future against the angels, but my Ava is made by General Dynamics. And so, like, I've got to wait till the guy who makes $500,000 a year to be like a TIG welder, you know, fucking back at the fob to, like, fix my fucked up foot. So in the meantime, like, they're just, the angels is just playing scary music. Angels are completely wiping shit out. And that dude's <laughs> like, no, sorry, I'm on crew rest. It's like, you're not even flying. You're just a mechanic. He's like, now nah, I'm on crew rest. <laughs> and and the, the fluid that fills the cockpit so you can breathe will absolutely give you cancer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's not negotiable. That's in the contract. I have to throw this in there as a get cancer thing. Just I know that we don't want to get too off track here, but there's a story. It's really fucked up, but it's also extremely true. Uh, in the early days of the global war on terror, when the U.S. had a base called Karshi Khanabad in Uzbekistan, also known as K2, we eventually got kicked out of Uzbekistan because even the Bush administration was just like, Yo, y'all are a little bit too big on human rights abuses. And the... Uz- Christ, Uz- Uz- I didn't know we did that. Yeah, and the Uzbeks kicked us out. But it's also good they kicked us out because uh, the base where they, the K2 was on the site, and I am not making this up, it was built as a tent city on the site of a Soviet military and then later Uzbek military NBC decon site. So <laughs> the entire base was built on basically a field that was u- used for nuclear, biological, and chemical decontamination. And so basically in the rainy season, spring, et cetera, it would be a mud, just total mud getting churned everywhere, which was fully in fact, like, you know, uh, contaminated. And then in the dry season, it would just be dust blowing everywhere. And like the degree to which people who have been, who were stationed at K2 in that brief window of like, I want to say 01 to like maybe 05, the degree to which those people have cancer is it's unreal. And it's like, yeah, they knew course. in advance. It's... They're like, we're literally putting people in like the, like, hey, <laughs> the depleted uranium fucking scrapyard, basically. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> definitely do some mud wrestling while you're here to blow off steam. And then amazed they get cancer. Yeah, going for your morning PT run, your teeth fall out and you start shitting blood. Yeah. Like It's like my 2001 Sony Mavica digital camera it keeps having these weird white flash spots all over it. I don't know what. <laughs> I was like, ah, you know, dust got in the goddamn lens. It reminds me, there's a, there's a family guy bit from years and years ago where uh, uh, Mayor West rolled around in medic- like uh, radioactive waste and just got leukemia. Like he was trying to get superpowers. <laughs> fuck's sake yeah man it's it's really really grim so yes if if, to recap uh if the germans built a a plane that sounds cool but gets shot down a lot and also if america built evas you would get cancer from the fluid and absolutely you would have to deal with like kbr and fluor contractors not wanting to fix eva while the angels just whipped ass around and destroyed everything in the city you were supposed to be protecting i can't believe nerve has all these subcontractors (laughs) now uh (laughs) Now, there's pro- the, the thing after the Sturmbach is probably my favorite dun weapon that actually got rolled out, and it's the Werfer Granat 21. Um, this was a repurposed and redesigned infantry rocket barrage system that they then bolted onto fighters, which is the most Mad Max shit I have seen. Uh, and, and, like, I don't mean to, like, you don't have to hand it to the Nazis, but the guy who came up with this idea fucking rules. Because it's not like it was Hitler. <laughs> so we're, say we're, we're saying, so basically, like, primitive MLRS, but bolted onto a plane? Yes. That does rule. No, you cannot aim it. That does rule, to be honest <laughs> with you. I mean, because you think about, like, all right, in your heart, you know that the AC-130 that has the fucking 105 cannon in it is badass. The idea that a plane is flying around using a howitzer and firing it in direct fire mode and literally, like shifting the plane laterally in flight while it's fucking firing because of the recoil that is that really, rules. that's badass that's fucking sick like you put a howitzer in a plane and you shoot it fucking direct fire that is extremely cool so yes with like eight other weapons too yeah yeah like a <laughs> minigun and all sorts of other stuff i don't even remember the munitions on the ac-130 um and so similarly uh a very primitive MLRS on a plane. I don't know if it would be effective. Like you said, you can't, it's basically the, the same level of like accuracy as shooting bottle rockets off your fucking mongoose bike when you're 12 years old. <laughs> but it's much like that. It is badass. It is the, the, the Nazi version of a green shell from Mario Kart. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to point it and hope for the best. Now, the idea was that they would be able to launch rockets from outside the cone of fire coming from the bombers and then get the hell out of there. Each plane could only carry two of the oversized rockets, and hypothetically, they would fire them off really, really fast and then haul ass. Small problem, though. 
These things were not meant to be launched from a moving aircraft. For starters, as we point out, these things were not meant for planes, so the launchers were huge. Mm -hmm. Bolt two of these onto the underside of a plane, and suddenly your plane doesn't fly so well. Um, They managed to solve 50% of this problem by having the pilot jettison the rocket tubes after firing, so at least on their way away from shooting at the bombers, they could actually control their plane, but... They still had to get on target, and it made it a pain in the ass. And the huge rocket pods were a dead giveaway to escort aircraft. So there was like a giant sign that like, for the love of God, shoot me down first. That's extremely fun. Like, this is something like, I always thought that it was stupid in those like, you know, vertical scrolling uh, arcade games like 1942 or whatever, you know, where they would be like fantasy versions of World War II aircraft. And you'd have these kinds of things like, you know, the the plane with the big, dumb, huge weapon, but it's also incredibly vulnerable. I didn't realize that was based on a true story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, as for the rockets themselves, they had such low velocity that they were super slow. And when they got launched from the plane, they would almost immediately drop and plummet back down to Earth. Even after trying to install some, like, midair stabilizer fins, it didn't do much to counter this because the rocket itself was meant to be fired from a stationary ground launcher. Also, there was no way to aim them. Like I said, the pilot just had to eye fuck his plane in the general direction of a moving bomber and let these rockets rip and hope for the best. Uh, The rockets would explode on a time delay fuse that was preset by ammo technicians. Okay. It could not be adjusted while flying. So on top of flinging the rockets akimbo into the distance, he had to time it <laughs> again with two moving targets. Wait, uh, you couldn't it, adjust the time. You, you, could, you could time it in the sense of you're firing it and you know how much time it's got, but like you don't get to set the time delay. So like... No. <laughs> Just a guy on the ground does it. So you're like, God, I hope I'm in 30 seconds range or whatever as like fucking, you know, you know, aces high are just shredding the fuck out of you with machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> or like just hitting the the allied bomber with like a tactical bonk because the missile of the rocket isn't armed it just bounces off you know honestly i feel as though uh, a nazi version of mario kart would actually make sense within the nazi ideology because like it classifies all different groups of people as animals and that like you're basically good or bad depending on what kind of animal you are so like i would terrified at what the nazis would come up with to be the equivalent of the blue shell but i absolutely think the nazis would see mario kart and be like yep this is correct there are good and bad races and some of them are, are superior to others like mario kart is in its own right part of the nazi weltanschauung and i feel as though we should probably purge all of this from our 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 you know our culture at large because uh i don't think it's good for people to think that some people are just big mushroom humans that are weak and uh you know incapable of standing up to huge turtles with spikes coming out of their backs i'm more of a yoshi guy and i don't know what that says about me uh, I, I, I'm worried I'm falling uh, uh, somewhere below because uh, he's a dinosaur that people ride for fun. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, not, that's not a good sign. No, it's really not. Now, I mean, he, he like literally like like epistemologically is an untermensch. So like <laughs> that's not looking good for you, Joe. Story of my life. Now, uh, they attempted to fix the velocity problem by mounting the rockets at an angle so they'd fire straight up as they possibly could, which would then, of course, fire exhaust directly into the face of the pilot, blinding them for a few seconds. This is insane. So, like, they basically are like, you have to go and do, like, a hedgehog quill attack. You have to yeah. fly under shit and fire it straight up. <laughs> this is You're amazing. You're playing fucking space invaders in an actual combat yeah, zone. legitimately, man, this is the kind of thing, like, there was a story recently uh, about... A, a Japanese hacker who created like a ransomware thing where you had to basically get this impossible score in what was described as a bullet hell game. And I didn't know what a bullet <laughs> hell game was. So I went and looked at this game that he basically uh, forced you to play on your computer and before you could get your computer back. And it's it's impossible. It's just, just, just endless bullets flying everywhere in just bizarre geometric patterns. And it's like, that's I see why they did this in this game. They learned about this German plane and we're like, oh, yeah, you have to shoot. You have to fly under shit and shoot perfectly upwards and get hit by your own back blast <laughs> while flying. Also, it massively oh. alters your trajectory and like th- the aerodynamics of your aircraft. I imagine when they fired it, like it like throws the plane off, too. Uh, and like, now, balance is very important when you're flying a plane. Like you kind of don't want to like be unbalanced. Just like seeing is, yeah. yeah. Like uh, you can't see through the exhaust while flying towards like, uh, you know, airborne bullet hell. 
Um, now I could find claims that um, at least 10 bombers were taken out directly with rockets with pilots realizing their limitations and instead switching to use them to burst midair and disperse tightly packed together fighter escorts and bombers, at which point they would conduct normal gun runs on the bombers with other fighters. However, this still led them into contending with escorts and bomber gun crews, which meant the entire plan was completely pointless. And with that, they rolled out the Nazis. They rolled out the emergency fighter program, which is never a good sign with a name like that. This happened around the time that the Nazis were rolling out the famed fighter jet of the war, the ME-262, which was kind of a clusterfuck of different mechanical problems, as you can imagine, of rolling out a fighter jet in the 1940s and making it mostly with slave labor in caves. Uh, but it was... It was very easy to be the best at something when the only jet with combat experience during the war. Like the U.S. did put out the P-80 uh, shooting star in time to get it to Italy, but I never actually saw combat until the Korean War. So when you're in a class of your own, it's very easy to win. Uh, now, one of the major drawbacks of the ME-262, of which there were many, is what that was really hard to build. Uh, so much so that it was entirely impractical for Germany to try to roll it out in large numbers while the entire country fell apart around them. For example, the 262 required highly advanced materials that were already in short supply and thousands of skilled man hours to build correctly, which they didn't have any of those left either. Uh, the engine had a very short service life due to the fact that engineering was short on quality parts and corners were cut, requiring frequent overhauls for, to the jet engines, meaning the planes couldn't even be used that often and made them a resource beast in a military that just didn't have resources anymore. However, despite all of this, Lieutenant General Adolf Galland wanted the 262 to be the country's top priority in regards to air power, thinking that they would be able to crank them out fast enough to turn the tides of the war, which, spoiler alert, that didn't work out. Yeah, However, I was thinking about this, and I'm sorry <laughs> to interrupt you, but like when you made the comment about they were able to take out 10 bombers this way with a shoot upwards hedgehog gun. And it's like, great. Okay. You knocked out 10 bombers. Like they were building tens of thousands of these fucking things. Like you're not really inflicting a death blow on allied capacity. Like losing 10 bombers would be a death blow to German capacity at this point in the war, <laughs> but not really to the allies. Yeah. I, I like destroying 10 allied bombers, I think is what would, would cost six uh, hours at a Detroit factory. Yeah, you're only 15 minutes into the movie Memphis Bell at that point. <laughs> now, however, Hitler agreed about the 262 because he was a fucking idiot and he was a sucker for wonder weapons. However, Albert Speer, the war armaments minister, pointed out that we need something else while we wait for the 262s to start miraculously rolling off the slave assembly lines. And that's where the emergency fighter program comes in. The German Ministry of Aviation sent out a request proposal for these stopgap fighter jets on uh, September 8th, 1944 uh, to every company in Germany that could still feasibly make an aircraft. This included Messerschmitt, Junkers, Blom and Voss, and Heinkel. Not surprisingly, Messerschmitt wanted nothing to do with it because they had enough problems with the 262. Junkers bowed out as well, and Blom and Voss submitted a design for the P211, which was... So complicated and hard to build, it was rejected immediately, though noted for being significantly better than the Heinkel design. So, of course, Heinkel wins by default, which is always a good sign of building a jet with no budget or materials. Uh, I can't imagine like, oh, so we picked the best design, right? No. No, we, 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 we design. We just got one of the submissions, yes. Yeah, uh, that, that was it. That was the only uh, submission that we could feasibly build because it was... He's shit. Uh, Heinkel had already designed what they'd been working on for a few months, though it only existed on paper. And Heinkel seemed to hate Messerschmitt and their 262 because in a paper presented in July of 1944, it directly roasted it for its various flaws, namely how hard it was to fly and its terrible fuel consumption rate. So he solved this by creating a jet that was, theoretically at least, so stupid easy to fly, it would require virtually no instrumentations or equipment and uh, that would weigh more and therefore drag down fuel economy. Some would say, so easy, a child could fly it. Uh-oh. I never like it when it's made <laughs> that easy. I think that may be a bad thing. No, the problem is, is uh, Heinkel was not, was not correct about this. It's still a jet. It's going to be hard to fly. And, uh, and because the 262 is sucking up all the valuable jet pieces, the entire thing would be made out of plywood supported by the most minimal amount of metal possible to save resources. 
minus the cartoonishly large jet engine that'd be slapped on the top of the thing. Wait, so that's basically, that's the origin then, is the design was proposed and accepted, and then they changed it and threw the fucking jet on top? No, the jet was always on top. Um, yeah. And uh, another fun thing about design, if you like we looked at a picture of it, you'll notice the jet intake is directly behind the cockpit. That means you cannot bail out or you'll die. You'll be sucked into the engine and churned into pudding. Wow, I did not think of that. They did eventually uh, fit an explosive ejection chair for the pilot. Uh, so it would shoot them clear of the, the jet intake. But it was considered so dangerous that nobody tested it and nobody should ever use it. So it's safer to be sucked into a jet engine. Wow. They did, they did find they did find one way, uh, hypothetically, of course, that a pilot could bail out. And that is assuming your jet isn't uh, heavily damaged to the point you lose control of the engine. You have to completely power down the jet engine and then jump out, uh, which I'm sure you'll be doing as you're plummeting towards the earth after getting shot by an allied fighter. Yeah. You know, I, you know, something to people who may not know this civilian listeners or people who weren't airborne for example like this is it's not the same as flying a jet for example different altitude but just to give you an example of call it the ratio uh when you're jumping out of an aircraft a static line jump for doing your basic military parachute operations you're jumping in training you're jumping at like i want to say 1500 feet or 1250 feet and then typically like you know in in combat operations it would be like a thousand feet but at 1,250 feet, you have about 60 seconds from the typical opening shock, you know, your parachute opening up to bend when you touch the ground. But if your parachute fails to open it, you have six seconds. Jesus and if you Christ. don't react within four seconds, you probably will not get your reserve parachute open in time before, you know, for it to catch enough air to slow you down before you hit the ground. Like the reason why they train you nonstop in airborne school of like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 or fucking pull your, pull your reserve is the fact that uh, you, you just, you, if you don't make that decision automatically, you're going to fucking hit the ground and die. And so I just think about that with a jet, like this is a lot of this stuff's experimental, you know, you're in fucking combat. So like there's not a lot of sort of uh, gutter guards kind of sh- directing you towards where you're supposed to be going. It's, it's kind of free for all. And you would have to make the decision to power down your engine to safely eject before you hit the ground. Like, I don't really think that's going to happen. Yeah, you're in a wooden box going 500 miles an hour rocketing towards the earth. Good time to make some quick decisions. And you basically have, uh, you know, just just, just for every every thousand feet or so above uh, ground level you're at, just think you have about six seconds for every thousand feet. So yeah, yep. that's going to be covered very quickly. Yep. Yeah, I bet it will, especially when you're fucking dogfighting. Like, you know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> Obviously, some of that is high altitude, but some of it's not. And uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Now, the jet was officially dubbed the HE-162 uh, because they actually named it that. They knew the allies would eventually find out about it. It's kind of like when they named SEAL Team 6. It's because they wanted the Soviets to believe there was like five more of them at the time or whatever. Uh, they wanted them to think that there were so many jets in uh, production that they're up to 162. Um, it didn't work. The Allies saw through it quite immediately because they're like, they can't possibly build that many jets. That's stupid. But they tried. Um, and it went from a, you know, a, a, a design on a fucking barroom napkin to a prototype in 74 days, which is the build quality I like in my jets. It yeah, <laughs> 74 days i'm sure they ironed out all the kinks like will the wings fall off if i turn uh now it weighed just over six thousand pounds fully one third of it was plywood because it was the only resource the government said they could use as much of as they wanted uh and the first test play test that nah, the first test flight was made uh december 6th uh, by uh, Gothard Peter, uh, and he reached 500 miles an hour, which is only 50 mile an hour slower than the 262. Everything went great until he flew it a second time. Ah, I see. Peter was tearing ass uh, right in front of Luftwaffe officials and made a high speed turn, something that, you know, all jets should be able to do. However, this jet is made out of wood, and the left wing just tore the fuck off. It cartwheeled into the ground, exploded, and killed him. I see. Yeah, that sounds really bad. You, you kind of <laughs> don't want 
your plane that's going 550 miles an hour, 500 miles an hour to just simply rip apart when you turn it. I feel as though that would be kind of... In uh, front of everyone. In front of everyone. All of the Luftwaffe, like, top brass were there to see him die. Oh, so it's basically any given air show at any given day. Yes. Yeah, that is correct. Um, now, what do you think the cause of this crash was? Besides the fact it's made out of wood. Uh, I am going to guess that the plane was like its structural integrity was damaged to so great a degree from that first flight that it wouldn't have been safe to fly in any other way. That like basically the, the, cons- the construction itself, what it's made of, is such that like it, it like degrades the materials by flying it at all. That is mostly correct. So it turned out nobody at Heinkel had thought to test if the load-bearing wood glue that held the wings on would work at 500 miles an hour. Oh my, load-bearing wood not. glue. Yeah, it, the wings were glued on. You know... You know, it's like we, we make jokes about stupid military occupational safe, like safety health hazard things. But God, I mean, go figure fucking, you know, uh, famous for, 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 for slave labor and extermination camps. The Nazis aren't really good on OSHA shit. But like every time you encounter <laughs> something like new is like a surprise to you, something you haven't read before. You're just like, damn, you guys really just didn't give a shit. I, I imagine Nazi OSHA would be like the worst kind. Oh, that wood glue is too strong. You need to make it weak. It's like, oh, the, the fumes uh, in this factory know, aren't killing sure that enough the fuel slave eats laborers. You. Yeah. Now, whoops. Who would have thought that wood glue and fucking jets don't mix? Uh, it was also discovered that the glue they were using was so acidic due to the, uh, the lack of resources that it was pretty much the only glue that they could use, that when they applied it, not only would it fail at high speeds, it ate the wood. It, like, burned away the wood. Uh, However, they had no other options. They just didn't bother fixing it. It didn't stop anyone. (laughs) After the second flight killed the only man to fly it, the Nazis said fuck it and began production, though with the engine throttled down to only go 310 miles an hour so they could keep using the wood glue, which again was eating the wood. But as they began to build it, people realized that there's a lot of other problems as well. Uh, for one, you shouldn't build jets out of wood and slap a giant engine on top of it. Neither pitch nor yaw could be controlled at high speeds. Uh, uh, this is because when it even hit 300 miles an hour, the wood would warp and twist under pressure, which is bad. Yeah. And despite the fact that fuel economy was a major part of the design, it could still only fly for about 30 minutes because its engine had terrible acceleration, required a long runway, and that's not something that Jeremy had a lot more of now due to all the bombs <laughs> you know it's funny because it's like the spruce goose is insane but the whole concept of the spruce goose is that you have this gigantic wooden prop plane that can carry a lot of cargo like it's not going to be flying insane fast speeds it's not going to be banking you know to taking like acrobatic turns it's just like can it fly safely okay now load it up with as much shit as you possibly can it was like the an224 of its day um and so it's like you understand the concept given the time it was dreamed up, but like it wasn't meant to be a stand in for something that can only operate safely if it's made out of metal that's, you know, bolted, welded, etc. together. So, like, I used to joke sometimes when I'd see people riding those like e scooters that you can rent on apps when I see them riding around London. Oh, yeah, I fucking hate oh, those. Yeah, they're so things. stupid. I was always like, you know, I, in a way, I can't hate people too much for riding them because, like, riding those in traffic in London feels like, hey, I built a plane out of balsa wood and I'm going to fly across the Atlantic Ocean with it. But see, I, I use that as a metaphor because it sounded absurd. I didn't realize that Nazis had actually done that. Kind of, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things that's always kind of uh, made me wonder about those scooters is like, who does maintenance on them? <laughs> like, uh, what if they? We have those here as well. And one of my friends was riding them. The fucking handlebars just came off uh, and he just plummeted into, into the street. Jesus. Like he had to go to the hospital. He's fine. But like, yeah, they go just fast jump as on hell. This. Yeah. Like I see like night. Yeah, crews. Do. I see like night crews coming out and picking up the rechargeable bikes, like the e-assist bikes around in London. Um, but I think about that too. It's like, okay, if I'm riding an e-assist bike and it fails, like it's annoying because they're really heavy if they're not powered. But if I'm riding a, a e-scooter and it fails, it's like, 
it, you just I don't know like it's basically oh whoops the wings fell off of my plane guess I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna get on my Icarus shit you know like you're gonna hit the road really <laughs> hard I just getting road pilled and by that I mean flying into yeah, the exactly, road because my flying, bird scooter fell apart yeah flying into the road and being condensed and compacted into the shape of a pill <laughs> yeah because like my friend texted me he's like bro one of the scooter's handles came off i was like what the fuck are you talking about he sent me a picture i guess he was going up because the first of all i'm sure most people listening have never been to this country but this country is not conducive to using anything on the sidewalks because you have to do parkour sometimes because it's a city that's a thousand years old on top of like bad soviet public engineering so the sidewalks are all different levels like staircases have no guardrails whatsoever and they will just be in the middle of the sidewalk and if you're not paying attention you'll just fall into someone's apartment like the, the idea that you're gonna get out a scooter and go rip an ass down one of these things is fucking insane to me yeah like Jesus. that's like that truly is asking to die the dumbest way possible yeah i i uh i mean i know we're talking about another dumb way to die in the luftwaffe in the 1940s but yeah, when I see those things, I'm just, I don't know, like, it, it just, I one time almost got wiped out on a bike bike trail, like a bike, paved bike path here in London by what appeared to be a kid, probably like 16, 17 year old girl in a cat suit on one of those scooters. Uh, <laughs> she was, she was checking her phone and just like, wasn't paying attention, had it drifted into the oncoming lane. And I was like, yo, 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 what the fuck? And like, she she dodged a little and I had to really swerve to avoid like getting hit by her shoulder. And I was just like, none of these words are in the Torah. Like this shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> but you just got taken out at a, uh, by a cat girl on a scooter. Yeah. And it's like, and it's like, I don't know what's more embarrassing being a cyclist, having to yell at people. Cause let, let's be honest. Like there's nothing cool about being a cyclist who's yelling. Like you just seem like a huge weird baby. Cause cycling is inherently comic and I cycling is how I get around. I'm allowed to say that, but, uh, or, getting killed by a teen girl in a cat suit on an electric scooter because you didn't want to be the angry cyclist. So you just got fucking plowed, like just completely <laughs> obliterated. I mean, I, I, you know, it's unfortunate because I wish you would have saved this story until the questions from the Legion that I have for this episode. Actually, you probably have a better story because you were in the army as well. You almost certainly do. I was thinking about this. That's the mentality of the Luftwaffe pilot. Like if you, if you complain, you basically are a traitor and you get, you, you're not allowed to complain, but like, if you get in the plane, it's going to kill you. So basically, you you aren't allowed to yell at the girl in the cat suit. You just have to get fucking obliterated. I, I'm, I'm not sure who the girl in the cat suit is here. Is it Hitler? <laughs> yeah, well, basically, basically the entire, the entire German industrial economy is now the girl in the cat suit checking a smartphone, riding the e-scooter on the Cable Street cycle path uh, just north of the river in London. Oh, God. We just and we whenever we have an uh, an episode together, we come up with the most cursed fucking lore on earth. <laughs> this happened to me. I swear to God, this happened to <laughs> last, me. Like I, I just last time it was Christopher of Benoit. Now it's this. <laughs> hey, now we got Cat Girl Hitler. It's God Sir damn it. Christopher of Benoit. Okay, he, absolutely. <laughs> he was a page. He was a squire. He had to do all the weird prayer shit. He got knighted. Uh, and yes, now we have basically have Cat Suit Hitler. <laughs> God damn it. Now. To be fair, all of these problems that we're talking about with the with the salamander, the Volksjäger, is the kind of hard work, quality, and uh, craftsmanship you would expect to get when you're putting together a jet fighter out of wood and glue in an underground slave factory. The plane was designed with twin 30 millimeter cannons in mind to be mounted to the nose. However, when they installed them and took them out to the range and fired them, it shattered the front of the plane because, again, it is wood. So they are downgraded to 20 millimeters. And it was also discovered during testing that if a pilot inverted the jet for any reason, the engine would die and then you would plummet to the ground and crash. Okay. So no barrel rolls. No barrel rolls, no inversions, which means no like acrobatic swoopy dogfighter turns that you would presume you'd want to be able to, you know, take advantage of the plane's capabilities to do. And I'm presuming the nose exploded from 30, probably just from the overpressure. Just like I think from just recoil yeah, or something. That's what I was gonna I guess. Know. Like like literally just firing that many, you know, explosively detonated rounds just caused the wood to explode. It's like it's basically this is the equivalent of, you know, you put the soup in the container in the microwave for four minutes instead of three and it fucking exploded, but like it's the front of a warplane. 
To be fair, the, the that soup explosion is what most of these pilots would end up looking like at the end of their service. <laughs> now, I I would hate to be the pilot that uh that figured out the whole upside down thing. He's like, oh, I'm gonna do a sick barrel roll. Oh god. Oh fuck. I feel like yeah, you you aren't really the pilot who figures it out so much as like you're the example that is used in the in the Nazi OSHA like movie reel. <laughs> Uh, oh no, Vine Balsa Wood has exploded. <laughs> Nein! <laughs> mein Flugzeug ist gefallen. Ich werde sterben. Warum habe ich dieses Catgirl getraut? <laughs> God damn it. Uh, now. <laughs> I do uh, speak German pilot... just not very well anymore. I spoke it as a kid, like it was my first language, but like. <laughs> I don't fucking speak it. So if that was wrong, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm trying. I think Germany is our number one non-English speaking uh, <laughs> listener base. So they will let me know. I'm sure. Uh, I, I pronounce enough things in German bad enough to know that they will tell us. Um, now, with a pilot that figured out that turning upside down would kill him, also found something else that you really don't want to find out about a jet. Um, it doesn't glide. Even though it was modeled after literal gliders, much like the comet, it would not glide. It fell out of the sky like a rock. But why? It had. <laughs> it was made of wood. Like, what about? I think it was just the the. It, I think the engine threw off its like center of gravity, and also they couldn't control the pitch or the yaw. So like. Oh God! <laughs> yeah. So wait, wait, if you couldn't control the pitch. I don't really understand planes that well, but like, so I understand. I don't either. Is that, is that is to suggest like that basically you only could control, I don't know, like one axis of movement. Like you had to do all of your flying that way. I think at high speeds, it was just like you were no longer a jet as much as you were an unguided missile. Right. Okay. I see. So what you're saying, it's not that you couldn't control it at all, but it's just like at a certain speed, you had to really slow down before you could turn in any way. Yeah, and remember, it's already leveled off at 300 miles an hour, because if it goes any faster, it'll disintegrate. This plane rules so hard, man. Seriously, like, this is genuinely like you made a plane out of box tops, and it's now time to fight a war with it. Now, this is around the same time that Reichsmarschall Hermann Goring walked his fat ass into the middle of all this and decided, wow, this plane would be perfect for children, specifically the Hitler Youth. And nobody is sure why he thought that, and that is not who Heinkel designed this for. He designed it for unskilled pilots because, when you know it, Germany was running out of those. So they're, they're like, okay, it's kids. And this is because Heinkel talked about how simple it was to fly. People had no idea about jets in general. Like Goring, whose flying experience was in World War I, suggested even glider or student pilots should be able to fly this jet effectively and it would require little to no training, despite the fact it has already killed so many test pilots. Yeah, it's like if your pilot experience was in World War I, then like you definitely would go into it with this sort of ethos because back in those days, it was just sort of like, well, I think this thing achieves lift. Maybe you can just like throw a novelty oversized anvil at the enemy trench from this. <laughs> um, like make sure that you don't, uh, you don't hold the anvil out too long because shifting the center of mass will cause the plane to just plummet to the earth because it's made out of matchsticks and canvas. So like, yeah, I could imagine that a guy who'd only ever done Red Baron shit would probably not understand. But you'd like, I mean, I guess this is the thing, right? You'd like to think someone would brief him up on it, but then you realize like the whole taxonomy of like the Nazi system was that like the guy was in charge because of whatever ideology and, you know, his position within the party and so it was just like no you don't get to tell Hermann Goering that the, you you know it's not a good idea to have children fly a plane that when we said it was simple <laughs> we didn't mean that simple yeah you, it's like um, that's the one of the reasons why like Albert Speer was trying to get around building so many 262s because he knew it was stupid and he had to explain a way around it without telling Hitler he was wrong same with Hermann Goering like Literally everybody who touched this jet knew knew immediately how bad of an idea it was to put children behind the sticks of this thing. Yeah, but it was harder than hell to fly. Hitler will start yelling in his bunker like, "Es war ein Befehl! Der Kinderflugzeug war ein Befehl!" You know, one of the things that's always kind of been curious to me. I, I love that movie. It's very good. Yeah, but what was the casting call like? Like, hey, 
I can't forget the actor's name, but like I can't remember the actor's name. It's like you kind of look like Hitler. Would you like to try out Bruno Gans? Like, I think he was. Bruno I think he was Austrian too. But the thing about I him, think he is. The thing about it is, I, I remember reading about this that it was kind of that was kind of a taboo in German cinema at the time. Like not in everywhere in the world, obviously, but like for German films, you know, written, produced, shot in Germany. They didn't cast people to play Hitler. Having someone be Hitler was kind of like a taboo for actors in general, and so they would just use like like historical footage of Hitler to represent whatever was going on in the plot. Um, and so they, they just use a, a cut in of like a, an anime character for Hitler. <laughs> <Fuck> <laughs> shit. Yeah, and so uh, and so if I remember correctly, also like with Bruno Gans, like the real struggle was that like Hitler's speaking delivery voice was very different from the way that he talked normally. Because he had like a yeah. really strong like working class Austrian accent, and Austrian accents are nuts. And so he, uh, but they found like a, a, they some footage from like a like a secret recording of Hitler's it was Finland, of, yeah, in yeah, Finland he, yeah, yeah. And, and then that was like, oh, this is what Hitler's actual speaking voice was like. So yeah, I mean, Bruno Gans, I'd seen Bruno Gans in other films before. Like, it's just it was like a huge role for him, and I, I think that movie is r- genuinely really good. But it's just, it was kind of like a watershed moment, I think, to be like, we have our A-list actor and he's playing Hitler. And it's like, <laughs> I just don't think that, I mean, obviously, like, I left Germany as a kid, but that's what it was like. I mean, in terms of, there was definitely a fine line of, like, taboos and shit that, like, you didn't cross with that stuff. Or polite company didn't cross them, whereas, like, your neighbors would be flying the Confederate flag, the U.S. Confederate flag. But they're like, guess what this actually means? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, states' rights, Nate. Yeah, Everybody exactly. does that. God. Yeah. Staatenrecht. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably all Reichsburgers or something. Now, uh, this the 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 one six two is harder than hell to fly. A fact not made easier by the lack of instrumentation that is normally around to make things easier for a pilot. However, the Hitler Youth would need training gliders to prepare themselves for flying the one six two, and after that, Goring thought would be three weeks of training at most. Before you jump in this rocket. Uh, in ca- yeah. Uh, in case you want to know how well this is going, it turns out, it was the same training gliders that were being used to train Comet pilots, which, from our previous episode, we know does not end well. Also, I should point out, three weeks ended up being a charitable amount of time, because it would actually be way less. Whatever amount of time you're thinking, I promise it is less than that. That's really unfortunate. Hitler- <laughs> Hitler youth pilots learned to use gliders. The Luftwaffe began to cobble together uh, from regular units. In February, the first operational unit of 162s was organized, made up of regular fighter pilots, but those who had never handled a jet before. And remember, these are already pilots who had their training hacked to pieces due to all the other pilots dying. So at best they walked into this with like 25% of the training that they would have received three years earlier. 100 pilots were chosen, split into groups of 50 apiece, and uh, given a grand total, wait for it, 20 minutes of on-the-ground training before being blessed off for operations. Oh my god. I was going to make a joke about like, oh, three weeks, they've got the airborne school model just rocking and rolling. (laughs) But like, 20 minutes, all right. I mean... And it was literally just to teach them how to take off. There was no trainer aircraft, nothing. It was like, flip these switches, aim it that way. Don't hit the trees. Oh, God. I mean... How, they still didn't have enough pilots, though. So they had to fill this gap. You want to you wanna guess where they found these people at? Uh, injured soldiers, the disabled, the elderly, <laughs> kids who were too young to even be in high school. Uh, I don't know, people from punishment battalions. You tell me. Uh, all of the above. Anybody who happened to be nearby. Um, one guy had been an anti-aircraft gun operator before being said, congratulations, you're a pilot. Uh, here's how you start this thing. Aim it that way. He crashed directly into the trees when he tried to take off because this might shock you. He did not know how to fly a plane. This happened constantly. Firsthand accounts of pilots note that when pilots were given a 162, they immediately crashed it in one way or another, either because of the obvious lack of training or because the one death trap they've been flying came apart at the seams and they plummeted Earth like a fucking meteor. Of these 65 factory test pilots who got to fly, five survived. I just... None of them were lost in combat. What What's killing me about this is that, like, surely the Germans of all people would be able to identify that even given the limited constraints they were operating under, this is inefficient. Like you spend a lot of time building these fucking things. 
you certainly spend more time building them, even if they're rushed, than you a guy spends immediately crashing it the first time it rolls down a runway. Yeah, I mean, this is a fatality level that I think is much worse than the comet, but like none of none of these these are just test factory pilots. None of these were lost in combat because we haven't gotten to that point yet. All of them crashed just figuring out how to get the fucking thing to work. They they crashing so many jets. Heinkel couldn't build them fast enough to get them to units that were actually trying to use them. The German government ordered them to build a thousand of these per month. Yeah, uh, because uh, the German government's dumb. Uh, a number sigh. so unrealistic. They never even built half of that number during the rest of the war, building about 320 of these. Though only 200 at most were considered airworthy and passed their very rudimentary uh, quality checks. I don't know how bad the build quality has to be for the Nazi QA guys in 1945 to be like, ooh, we can't use this one. Okay, it's, it's too bad. We need to get more. We need to get some more glue. Yeah, that's, now, that's, that's shocking. I mean, it's genuinely shocking. Like, we make jokes, we riff, you know, it's fun. We love this podcast. But that's, that is genuinely a shock to hear. Yeah, they just didn't give a fuck. <laughs> I mean, that isn't to say that the 162 didn't claim some victories. Well, victory. It claimed a single victory on April 19th. Uh, a captured RAF fighter pilot uh, claimed that during interrogation that he had been shot down by a jet aircraft and the 162 unit commander claimed credit in the name of a Hitler youth cadet who did not get to bask in his glory because immediately after shooting down this uh, this uh, this fighter plane, his jet engine stalled out and he crashed to earth and died. Uh, so that was that was it. Uh, there was allegedly one other confirmed shoot down by a 162 when a pilot claimed to have shot down a de Havilland mosquito. Uh, which was confirmed by two other pilots. However, an anti-aircraft battery on the ground had actually shot it down and claimed that they had recorded it on video. I see. So that one gets the old Barry Bonds asterisk next to it. Yeah, that sucks, man. That really sucks. Uh, I mean, part of me thinks to myself, like, imagine if you were the one guy who was confirmed shot down by this piece of shit. <laughs> like, imagine how much of just everyone being like, dude, for real, they they literally like let a kid build a model plane and it shot you down. Yeah, like how did you graduate from fighter school or whatever and get slapped out of the sky by a kid with twenty minutes of training flying like a, a fucking rocket toboggan? I mean, to be fair, like let's not be too hard on the poor guy because I mean nowadays pilots are constantly being killed because the company they fly for didn't buy the extra DLC from Boeing. So like the, the safety DLC, yeah, exactly. of course. So I mean like. Dumber things have happened in aviation. Oh, dumber things will continue to happen in aviation. It's like when the um, the U.S. built a plane, then sold it to Germany, and uh, just kept crashing repeatedly. Like, oh yeah, I think the wings are too short. Whoops. <laughs> Which one was that? Uh, fuck, I can't remember what it's called now. It's not the Shooting Star. The one six twos flew missions all the way until the end of the war, still taking off from their base until May fifth, nineteen forty five, when the runway was finally captured by the British, and then the war ended on the eighth. In all, around one month of real combat time, the 162 is a miserable failure on every level. It claimed one plane for sure at the cost of, at minimum, 70 dead pilots, if we count both the test group and the operational units. All of them died from some Acme-ass plane crash that may have been avoided if someone spent just a little bit more money on glue. After the war, the British and American and French Air Forces captured the remaining 162s and flew some of them, which... Certainly went better than when they tried to fly a Comet. Uh, British test pilot Captain Eric Brown, a guy with the nickname Winkle for some reason. Uh, his name is Eric Winkle Brown. That's got to be sexual. I'm sorry. It's British. <laughs> it, I, just, like, like, I know sometimes we're unfair in ganging up on the British, even if though I don't believe you can be unfair against them. But like, that's got to be sexual. Yeah, especially in the military. Uh, he judged the jet and... Innovated concept that was quite tricky to operate, which is you know the normal British. Uh, that's like toning down of seriousness. Yeah, that's like British understatement for like you are going to die. Yeah, I mean he called it a quote unforgiving airplane, which is another one of those Britishisms. Uh, like ah yes, it's quite tricky, especially that time an acidic glue melted through the cheap plywood and burnt into my eyes. It was jolly good fun. Exactly. It's like oh oh, it's fine, not bad. You know, no fuss. Yeah. We'll muddle through, and it's like just. Arms and legs being fucking forcibly removed. It's awful. Everything shit. is on fire. Yeah, exactly. 
In case you want to go and look at one of these death traps in person, you can, depending on where you live. There are several in the UK, France, and the US. The US has two at the Smithsonian, another in Chino, California, I assume for robbing banks. Uh, and there's one in Canada at the Aviation Museum. So if you want a plane to absolutely not steal because it will kill you, that's the plane for you. Uh, so I'm curious if people think that this is dumber than the than the Comet was at this point, but that is the, the, the Nazi jet fighter for kids. Well, you know what? I mean, in a way, I wondered if the bat wings at the Air and Space Museum were the ones you were going to talk about. So in a way, I'm like, no, this is dumber and worse. But then the balsa wood, the wood eating glue, the glued on wings, la- total lack of control past a certain speed. Uh, I mean, so much of this stuff is just, it's a delight. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to have to fly it. It sucks. It's kind of sad, but it's also very funny. You only use it once. I mean, maybe you might have get to take off like half of everybody else. Well, um, I mean, fire and forget is a very versatile term. <laughs> So, Nate, we do this thing on the show called Questions from the Legion. Uh, if anybody would like to ask us a question from the Legion, uh, you can donate to the show, ask us on Discord, Patreon, and then we'll answer it. This person asks, what's the dumbest way you've ever hurt yourself? I.e., I once got a second degree burn from making mashed potatoes. Wow. Nice. Well done. Okay. Yeah. Well, Joe, do you know off the top of your head? Because, I mean, I, I definitely have some good ones. Uh, I once broke my foot uh, because... I got really, I was quite young. I was like preteen maybe uh, because there's some kid in the neighborhood that was pissing me off and he was rode by in his bike, uh, his bicycle. And I ran up and kicked the tire, which is a supremely bad idea. Ooh. Like it bent my foot in the wrong direction, Ooh, just uh, annihilated it. Fuck shit. Did he at least fall off his bike? No, he just rode away laughing. Oh Jesus. That sucks so bad. Cause you like got humiliated and then didn't hurt him either. Yeah. That, that's a, definitely a crowning achievement of young Joseph's life. What's the stupidest way I ever got hurt? Um, you know, it's funny because like you could, if you can find it, I mean, in terms of it being a close call, the absolute stupidest thing that I, to this day, I cannot believe I did. No one even dared me to do it. I just said, I'm going to do this because I think it's funny. I was in, <laughs> I was in uh, Oakland, Michigan for a swim meet when I was in a, a club swimmer when I was in high school. Condolences. Yeah. Is that Oakland County or Oakland? Oakland, the town, I think is what it's called, but it was definitely Oakland oh, County. It's like right north of Wayne County. Yeah, it was actually, it's like, Oakland fine. County. Fine. It was. It was like it, it just seemed like kind of suburbanish. It was like there yeah. was some uni- some small regional university that had like an Olympic distance like big pool like natatorium, and so they were having some like conference for swim clubs in the Midwest there. So we got put up in like a shitty like Ramada Inn or something in in uh, in Oakland, and they had a pool and a a kiddie pool, and us being moron teenagers was like nothing to do. Like we could go to like, there was l- nothing around there. It was just like in a strip mall. So we came back from the meet, like, you know, I think we had gotten, they had gotten us food and we just like hang out in the rooms. But you got to remember, this was like pre smartphones, pre portable DVD players. So we basically had like the TVs in the room and, you know, our CD players, like our disc man, CD players and stuff. But like, this is 2001 pre pre nine 11, of course, so halcyon days. And um, I went down to the pool with my friends, the kids that I was in the same room with. So like we were sleeping in the same room and I would have probably been 16 and they would have been 15, 16 also. And I was like, I'm going to lane dive into the kiddie pool. Now, if you know what it's from swimming lane dive, it's like you, you, we, we jump in ways where you think we're going to hurt ourselves, but like you don't have to have water that fucking deep to do a lane dive. Like if you know what you're doing, like the way you move your body and stuff, you hit the water, you arc outwards and like, you know, so I can, I wouldn't want to fuck around with it now because I'm <laughs> bigger and fatter and slower and easily injured. But like at 16, yeah, you jump into <laughs> fucking two feet of water, three feet of water, whatever, like you can do fine. Anyway, I don't know how deep this kiddie pool was, but it wasn't very deep. And I did, and I, I successfully lane dived into it, but I scraped the fuck out of my face. And I think about it to this day face, because she's like my, the, my face scraped the bottom of the pool. And it's like, I had like road rash from my face all the way down my nose. No, I was fine. It was just a scrape. Like people were like, what happened? I was like, oh, I bumped a door or some shit. But if that had gone sideways, like two inches, I would fucking be dead. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Would just be like, oh, Nate died in the fucking pool in August, 2001 or July, 2001. Died in a kiddie pool. Died in a kiddie pool in Oakland, Michigan, because no one even dared me. I was just like, oh, this is, this is a good idea. Like this is, this will be funny. This will be cool. And, and people were like, aha, yeah. Okay. All right. Whatever, man. 
Like, <laughs> bro, I, I, so like to this day, like that wasn't a severe injury at all. It genuinely wasn't. I, but I could have fucked my teeth up. I could have broken my nose. I could have gotten brain damage. I could have died. There's so many ways I could have died or hurt myself severely. Yeah, absolutely. I cannot fucking to this day believe I did that shit, dude. And like, so little bit of a scrape, but could have been so much worse. Absolutely. I, I just it, like the concept of maybe someday being a parent that eventually you have a teenage child. Like, I'm not worried about them fucking and getting fucking pregnant or getting somebody pregnant. Like whatever life happens, you try to like teach them the best you can. But that shit, the teenage urge to kill yourself stupidly <laughs> while not trying to commit suicide scares the fuck out of me. Because God, dude, I wasn't even that bad and I had it that bad. Oh, yeah. I think everybody listening probably has a story of them doing something absolutely stupid. Um, Nate, thank you so much for joining us here today. This is the area where you can plug your various other shows uh, in case anybody is not aware of them. Yeah, so I do a show with a friend of the show, Francis Horton, called What a Hell of a Way to Die, which is us talking about military and veterans, news, culture, etc. from a left-wing perspective, or from at least a not right-wing chud perspective. Uh, And I also am the producer and co-host of a show called Trash Future, which is about uh, a tech pessimist take on the on the tech industry and the various kind of nonsense culture around tech in general. Uh, I'm also the producer of this show uh, and now sometimes co-host, and I produce a wonderful show about movies called Kill James Bond that reviewed all the Bond films from an anti-Bond perspective, but now also reviews lots of Euro spy and action movies uh, from three wonderful people. Take that again. Three wonderful people. Alice Caldwell, Kelly, Abigail Thorne, and Devin. So uh, any of those shows, my fingerprints are all over in one way or the other, and I hope you enjoy them. Did they finally make it through all the Bond films? Oh, yeah, a while ago, man. Then they made it oh, through okay. all the Bourne films. Uh, <laughs> and the Bourne, the Bourne episodes were really funny because like, I'd forgotten how bad the Bourne movies were, like good and bad at the same time. Oh, they're nuts, yeah. Yeah, and how much like the Bourne identity is like, like genuinely... Franca Potente's role in that film is just to be like your fantasy Euro girlfriend. Like, it's, oh God, they're so good. Listen to the show. Right now, all their bonus content is free because we're going through this horrible cost of living crisis. And so until April, all of their normal Patreon content is just being published. They're calling it the winter of content. It'll all be available for free. So if you want to check them out and get to like real deep dive on these movies, uh, you can you can go check them out. There's I believe it's just the website killjamesbond.com, but Google Kill James Bond podcast and uh, yeah, until April first, their whole Patreon library is free. Awesome, uh, everybody! Thank you for listening to the show. If you like what we do here, consider donating. Uh, even a dollar gets you episodes like this for free. It gets you access to the Discord. It gets you other bonus content. Uh, or if you don't have money, don't want to give me money, that's perfectly fine. It's your money. Do with it what you want. But uh, leave a review. It's free. It helps us out a lot. Um, thank you again. And until next time, don't build jets, uh, out of wood.